So grace, mercy, and peace belong to you. They are free gifts from the one who was and is and is to come. You probably heard that Pete Seeger died the other day. Now, if you're of a certain age, like me, you might have gone about a little misty-eyed this week. Some of his iconic social protest songs were played over and over. Songs like If I Had a Hammer, or We Shall Overcome, or Where Have All the Flowers Gone. The list is endless, but all of his music spoke in some way to a time when our collective consciousness seemed more concerned with a sense of justice, with doing the right thing, rather than today's ethos, which is dominated by rigid judgment, fear, and a degree of mistrust. Many of Pete's prophetic songs even made their way into a lot of church liturgies. You may not know that. For example, Turn, Turn, which is based on the third chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes. And if time permits, we might even play another Seeger song here today, God's Counting on You, at the close of worship. I bring up Pete's passing, not so much out of a sense of nostalgia, but as a way of commenting once more how God's voice continues to speak to our modern context in new ways from Scripture. For in listening again to this lusty tenor, I hear, as I hope you can, the echoes of one of the great, great teachings of our Savior, the Beatitudes, which begin the Sermon on the Mount. For the next two weeks, my prayer is that we can look at these eight statements, eight statements of what it means to be blessed in God's eyes, as a way of understanding our unique individual calls to live into God's kingdom as God intends. And as I hope to show by the end of next Sunday's worship, God's call is not just for a select few, but for all. For everyone, each of us, as the banner outside our sanctuary door proclaims, we are blessed to be a blessing. And as part of this reflection today, my prayer is also that you may come to see that the be attitudes for what they truly are. And that is not merely a punch list of characteristics you need to have accomplished in order to pass into the kingdom of heaven. But it's a somewhat, indeed, radical manifesto of how God expects us to live and to relate to one another in this present life. For God's notion, you see, of justice isn't necessarily the same as ours. Most people, I think, if they look at the Beatitudes or think of them, tend to look at them as a litany of perhaps hopelessly idealistic, maybe even misguided virtues. Scholars, on the other hand, debate whether the Beatitudes are a heavenly entrance exam or whether they're a promise to reverse the fortunes of the downtrodden in the life to come. So this morning, drawing on some insights, some pastoral insights from the noted New Testament interpreter Mark Allen Powell, and the unique translations of Eugene Peterson from the message, I propose to look at the meaning of the Beatitudes in two groups of four sayings each. Today we will look at who we might be talking about when we talk about the poor in spirit, the mourning, the meek, and those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And righteousness, you have to hold in your mind, is biblical code for justice. Next week, we'll examine the remaining four statements of blessing and see how the two sets of descriptions might relate to one another. 
and perhaps more important, where do we go with this new understanding? So let's begin. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Some have understood poor in spirit to mean people who are humble or those who have voluntarily taken on a life of poverty. Some even say the phrase refers to people who are faint-hearted or just plain despondent. But the Hebrew text uses a different word, anawim which literally means bowed down, heavily burdened, almost stooped over from carrying a heavy load. In the Old Testament, this term was used to describe the dispossessed and abandoned in Israel. Those either from who were abandoned either during the, the transition of the Exodus or during the exile. But in practice, these were people who were also thought of as pious because to them they felt they had nowhere to turn other than to God. Eugene Peterson in the message captures a broader intent of Matthew. Listen. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you there is more of God and his rule. And when I think of who might such people be today, who are we talking about? I think, for example, of, on a broad scale of the refugees from war-torn Syria, or the dispossessed of many African countries, or closer to home, of a young African-American woman who came through that narthex door last Sunday morning as I was setting up for worship. No home, no visible means of support, no family, and desperate for something to eat. The gratitude on her face when I gave her a few dollars was really indescribable. However, as I watched her go out that door, hoping that she would come back because I invited her to worship, I felt my own sadness was really palpable. So I wondered how many more like her are there just outside our doors and seemingly beyond our help. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Those who regard all of the Beatitudes as criteria for heaven's entrance exam, I think are kind of stretching things with their description when it comes to mourning, which is hardly an attribute most of us would aspire to. It's even more of a strain to regard this Beatitude as a reference to people who are sorry and repentant for their sins, or who would protest evil and injustice by renouncing all of their earthly possessions. There are people like that. But if poor in spirit are those who find no reason to hope in this life, those who mourn, my friend Mark Allen Powell suggests, are those who find no cause for joy. Once again, listen to Peterson's insight. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Sounds contradictory, doesn't it? Only then can you be embraced by the one who is most dear to you. The clear implication, implication is that God will act so that those who mourn will not mourn anymore. One need only to think of the parents and families 
who mourn the senseless slaughter of children from the rampant gun violence in our country. Those families cry, I suspect, each night and lament in frustration that so many in their own country ignore their grief under the guise of an empty and rigid legalism that insists guns don't kill, only people do. Blessed are they who mourn. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now, a lot of interpreters seem to regard meek as a synonym for poor in spirit or humble. But a closer look at the early languages suggests that the people described in this blessing are more like those who have been humiliated or those who are oppressed or powerless. Like disinherited slaves and captives from the Hebrew exodus and exile, these are people for whom the gift of blessing must wait for a while. They have been denied access to the world's resources and have not had the opportunity to enjoy the creation God intended. Eventually, I think our text suggests, they are going to receive what they had coming to them all along. You know, the other night, Cammie and I rewatched that Academy Award winning movie, The Help. I'm sure some of you have seen it. About the life of black servants in the segregated South in the 40s and 50s. Story of patient coping in the hope of a better tomorrow. And it makes me think of those who struggle near poverty today working hard, often at two or three jobs, just to make ends meet, and yet maintaining what to me is an enviable sense of dignity and self-worth. If you're familiar with a lot of Seeger's music, you can almost hear the banjo strains lamenting the plight of the working man and the working woman. Here's how Peterson hears it. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are. No more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners, proud owners of everything that cannot be bought. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. This passage can be a little ambiguous because it can be read as either the promise of reward for those who live a virtuous life or a promise of reversal of fortune for those who are downtrodden. Perhaps it depends on where you sit. It helps somewhat to read this line of text again with the understanding that righteousness is biblical code for justice, for doing what is right. But in this case, the context refers to God putting things right in the coming kingdom rather than relying on human beings to do the right thing here on earth. Powell suggests that we look at this verse as summarizing the first three Beatitudes. In other words, those who hunger and thirst for a justice that has been denied them include people who have no reason to hope, people who have no cause for joy, and no access to the resources of this world. Contrary the popular interpretations of the Beatitudes. Being poor in spirit, being in a state of mourning, being meek, and hungering and thirsting for righteousness are not characteristics people should exhibit 
if they want to earn God's favor. Rather, these are undesirable conditions that will characterize no one, nobody, no how, when God's will is ultimately achieved. The people who would benefit when God rules, Jesus says, are those who otherwise have no reason for hope or cause for joy, who have been denied their share of God's blessings in this world and are deprived of justice, in short, people for whom things have not been the way they ought to be. For such people, the kingdom of God is a blessing because when God rules, all of this will change. God's righteousness, God's justice will prevail and all things will be set right. But there's more, as Paul Harvey used to say, more to the story. If our God's upside-down notion of how to make things right shows a preference for all manner of poor, where does that leave the rest of us? Those of us who don't see ourselves in one of these first four categories. How are we to receive God's blessing? What does it mean to show mercy, to be pure in heart? to be peacemakers, and all those qualities that are rewards for striving to be virtuous in this life? And how do all those lives that are defined by the second set of Beatitudes, which we'll look at more closely next week, how do those folks relate to those whose misfortune will be reversed in the life to come? Is it possible that some of us may be both rewarded and reversed at the same time? If you have your feet in one bucket, does that mean you're never going to have your feet in the other bucket? Or do you straddle with one foot in each bucket? Our search for blessedness will continue next week as we examine these kinds of questions and how we are each called to act. So until then, my prayer is that God's eternal shalom will unfold you as you consider your own blessed state. Amen.